Be masterful. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And yes, today we will be speaking about the future. In vitro gametogenesis is coming our way. And it will be, if our predictions um, stand the test of time, it will replace, or at the very least, significantly modify in vitro fertilization as we know it today. Plus, it will open up all kinds of other arenas which we will not emphasize today, but which I am often speaking about. And that is the notion of same-sex parenthood, which is to say, making it possible for members of the same sex who cohabitate, uh, subject to certain manipulations, to actually produce an embryo and subject to the availability of a surrogate to carry it to term. And so reproduction as we know it is clearly changing, uh, if nothing else, by dint of in vitro gametogenesis and where it seems to be heading. Now, we say all of this, of course, against the backdrop of IVF, which I don't have to tell you, is the brainchild of Bob Edwards from the UK, who received the Nobel Prize for this development in 2010. In 2028, we will be marking the 50th anniversary of the birth of Louise Brown, the first IVF baby ever born uh, in the United Kingdom, thanks to the pioneering efforts of Professor Edwards and others such as Dr. Steptoe, who sadly did not share in the Nobel Prize only because the Nobel Prize policy is to award the prize only to living recipients. And Dr. Steptoe unfortunately passed away by then. As a matter of fact, Professor Edwards was at the time suffering from significant uh, health issues and was unable to attend the ceremony in Stockholm. Instead, it was his wife who ended up flying to Stockholm and accepting the prize on his behalf. What we will be speaking about today is the next iteration of our future, um, wherein IVF uh, gives way to in vitro gametogenesis, or at the very least is significantly modified by it. It's a little difficult to pinpoint the beginning of IVG, but one good starting point is a paper published by Japanese investigators who still, as you will see, dominate this field, who in 2009 published a paper in the highly rated journal Cell that dealt for the first time with the possibility of creating artificial gametes, if you will. The two principles that led from the beginning, and I would have to say are still very much, uh, almost the sole drivers of this remarkable uh, development, are Mitinori Saitu from Kyoto University, and Katsuhiko Hayashi from Kyushu University. At the beginning, the two of them worked together. And roughly in 2013, when I was in Japan for another reason, I booked a flight to Kyoto to meet with these two gentlemen and spent a whole morning with them. At the time they were working together Later on, Professor Ayashi uh, 
established his own laboratory. But to this day, when you see a science paper or a nature paper on in vitro gametogenesis, almost always still, it is the brainchild of one of these two gentlemen. In our discussion today, we will, by necessity, start with the rodent paradigm and then move on to discuss where we stand with the human, which is not quite at the point where it's ready to be applied, but we can see the writing on the wall and we can see this coming to fruition before too long. Now, all of this, of course, builds on a pre-existing body of knowledge that has to do with the so-called pluripotent stem cells, which come in two varieties, embryonic or induced. But whichever way you arrive at a pluripotent stem cell, it has the ability to become any other cell type, which is mind-boggling. But in theory, we could replace a missing cell type in the retina. We could potentially cure Parkinson by replacing uh, dopaminergic neurons in the striatum. Or we could potentially replace uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord in individuals who are otherwise paralyzed. You can tell that the possibilities are endless. We are not there yet, but the potential, I think, is very real. Gametes is really just one facet of this broad field of stem cell development, a fact that was not lost on Science Magazine, which published an important spread in 2021 dedicated just to in vitro gametogenesis, and authored by the two gentlemen I alluded to earlier. The New England Journal of Medicine, not to be outdone, commissioned a similar paper from Mary Herbert and Azim Surani from the United Kingdom. Last year, in April, I organized and chaired a workshop, a two and a half day workshop of the National Academy of Medicine, which was solely dedicated to in vitro gametogenesis. So for two and a half days, a whole host of speakers address the multiple facets of in vitro gametogenesis, from the science to the social consequences to a variety of implications, all of which can be found in a consensus, not in consensus report, but in a report that was published thereafter, and which I'll be happy to direct any of you to if you're interested. This is a worldwide interest now, uh, and I'm showing here an infomercial, I guess, of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which is the premier ethics organization of the United Kingdom. And when they list their priorities for the coming year in human reproduction, in vitro derived gametes stops the list. Yes, they're going to be addressed the whole, are going to address a whole host of other issues. Time limits on maintaining embryos in culture, womb replacements, preconception screening, whole genome sequencing, genome editing, egg freezing, etc. In other words, they have a broad agenda, but it is telling that in vitro gametogenesis is at the top of the line. 
I think we can all agree without too much trouble that this is a disruptive technology. Whether or not it's achievable in the human, I think remains to be seen as I will illustrate uh, later on. And what timeline we're talking about is also an open question. But knowing what I know about the Japanese investigators who are at the forefront of this, I can't help but believe that one, it will be achieved in humans, and two, it will happen in the lifetime of the definitely the younger members of the audience. In projecting into the future, it's helpful to recall the pioneering work of Aldous Huxley, who in his book, Brave New World, in 1932, made several key predictions, one of which is that eggs will be produced via ex vivo ovarian cultures. Well, in vitro gametogenesis is not exactly that, but it's very close, which is to say he wasn't very far. He also predicted that embryos will be formed via in vitro fertilization, a prediction that was right on, of course, in hindsight. And he even projected forward and made the statement that newborns will be born via ex vivo ectogenesis, a field that is still being pursued, but has yet to transpire. The notion that children will be carried instead of in utero in an artificial uterus, if you will, has been around for a while, but it remains to be realized, of course. But IVF clearly happened, and so in that respect, the predictions made at the time by Aldous Huxley were perfectly correct. In the first chapter of his book, the so-called director of hatcheries and conditioning is saying, one egg, etc., no malady, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before means progress. And as it turns out, having 96 eggs or sperm in a, a dish is precisely what we are now experiencing with in vitro gametogenesis. The notion of converting a somatic cell eventually to an egg or sperm faced numerous theoretical obstacles, the, the most prominent of which was the so-called Soma germline barrier hypothesis, which was developed by August Weissmann, professor of zoology in Freiburg, who in his book, The Germplasm, A Theory of Heredity, maintained that the germline gives rise to the soma, which is immortal, meaning the germline is immortal. And that's something we can relate to. But he also predictably argued that the soma never gives rise the germline, which is mortal. However, IVG turned all of this um, and questioned, if you will, those otherwise very sensible projections. But we now know that subject to certain technologies, we can take a somatic cell and convert it to a germ cell. Now, to be able to proceed, it's useful to digress for a moment 
to discuss the formation of pluripotent stem cells because it's the stem cell that is the starting material for the egg or the sperm that we ultimately want to end up with. There are two technologies that make it possible to take a somatic cell and make a pluripotent stem cell out of it. The first is known as somatic cell nuclear transfer. It dates back to 1958. And it is the brainchild of John Garden from Cambridge University, who in 1958 published a technology that started with a nucleus of a somatic cell that was injected into an enucleated oocyte and gave rise to a quasi-zygote, which developed into a blastocyst with an inner cell mass from which one could derive embryonic stem cell. In 2006, a different technology was introduced by Shinya Yamanaka from Kyoto University, who published on the pages of Cell, a technology that involved starting with a stem cell, somatic cell, I'm sorry, in, transfecting it with select transcription factors and thereby giving rise to what is known as induced pluripotent stem cells. Both gentlemen, as you might imagine, received the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, and it is their contribution that makes it possible for us to take a somatic cell, convert it to a pluripotent stem cell, and then take that pluripotent stem cell and guide it towards a gametogenic fate. So in vitro gametogenesis, in its essence, it's about taking a somatic cell I'm saying skin cell, but you could really use any somatic cell. Convert it to either an embryonic or induced pluripotent stem cells by the technologies we just described, and then guide it towards a gametogenic fate. Now that's easier said than done, of course. And to be able to do that, you have to master certain prerequisites. You have to know what cues are required for this transformation. At what sequence should those cues be applied? And what timing should one follow? And then in the special case of eggs and sperm, we need to also take into account the so-called niche. That is to say, the cellular environment wherein eggs and sperm develop. And I don't have to tell this audience that eggs, of course, are surrounded by granulosa and theca cells. And sperm, in turn, are surrounded by Sertoli cells and other somatic cells. And so when you talk about developing gametes, you have to take into account their natural cellular environment because these two speak to each other and play a central role in gametogenesis. It's a little hard, as I said already earlier, to pinpoint the beginning, but it's useful to take a look at the 2003 science paper, the first, the senior author of which was Hans Schuller, then a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, but today the director of the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine in Germany. 
But there were many others. Toshiaki Noche published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on this subject. George Daly from Harvard Medical School, who is presently the Dean of Harvard Medical School, published in Nature on this topic in 2004. And Rene Rehopera, who at the time was at UCSF, published a similar paper in Human molecular genetics. And so as we go through the first 20 years of this century, multiple papers were published on the rodent in leading journals, and multiple papers were published in the human in equally leading journals. And so when we stop and assess the state of the art in 2015, we can say that we have made some advances. We realize that the germ cell generation process is not conserved between the rodent and the human, and that the genetic networks involved are quite distinct as well. But we did know at that time that you could take embryonic somatic cells or induced pluripotent cells, both of which varieties of stem cells, and convert them to primordial germ cell-like cells, all of which happened outside the gonad. What we couldn't do at that time was convert those precursors to haploid postmeiotic mature gametes, which is to say eggs and sperm, a process that happens inside the gonad. So the extragonadal piece was worked out, but the intragonadal piece had yet to be figured out. Which brings us to the final frontier, that is to say, accomplishing in vitro gametogenesis all the way. Here again, coming to the rescue, is Professor Hayashi, who published in Nature essentially the entire cycle of the mouse female germline in the rodent. He started with stem cells converted them to primordial germ cell-like cells, combined them with somatic cells, allowed them to develop into primary oocytes, eventually M2 oocytes, which are shown on the left lower hand corner, fertilized those eggs, gave rise to embryos and blastocysts, which upon transfer to pseudo-pregnant mice gave rise to pups. In other words, he reconstituted the entire cycle in the rodent, in the female rodent. The same phenomenon was accomplished in the male, in this case by Mitinori Saitu, who took essentially a primordial germ cell and developed it all the way in the male series, thereby accomplishing what we needed to know, but in the rodent. As I said, we are still hard pressed to render the human paradigm a complete reality. But we've made some progress. Here again enters our now acquainted Mitinori Saitu who published in Science in 2018 an early effort to create human eggs, M2 oocytes specifically. He started with human primordial germs like cells, 
combined them with somatic cells, and took the process as far as the oogonia. But he could not get to the M2 stage, which is obviously where you would want to be in terms of a mature oocyte that could be fertilized and taken from there. And so the same is true, I should say, about for the male, where the protagonist is a certain Kotaro Sasaki, an investigator who is presently at the University of Pennsylvania, who took the male pathway far, but not quite to the mature sperm stage. Which is to say that in human in vitro gametogenesis, we still have to reach the stage where we can show for our efforts M2 oocytes and spermatozoa, that is to say the end stage of the reproductive process prior to fertilization. Assuming we'll get there, it's useful to review what this will mean to us as practicing obstetrician gynecologists. Well, at the very least, this will advance science because it will provide an inexhaustible supply of germ cell. And it will allow us to study the function of indi individual genes by creating now mutants of one gene at a time. And it will provide us with a convenient tool to study germ somatic cell interactions, which are still to a large degree a mystery to this day. But on the clinical side, this will for the first time allow us to reverse germ cell failure that is to say, men or women who lack germ cells for one reason or another, whether inborn or radiation induced or who knows, surgically induced, whatever the reason, this could be one way to still allow these individuals to reproduce. In other words, we'll be in a position to provide autologous gamete replacement. And if for some reason the endogenous gametes are somehow flawed or genetically defective, we could gene edit them before they are replaced. And as I mentioned, although this is a separate lecture, we are now getting close, we're not there yet. But this technology, we can already see, will make it possible to accomplish genetic same-sex parenthood. This will also impact IVF, as you can imagine. We will no longer need to inject women with uh, gonadotropic hormones so as to stimulate the production of eggs, nor will we have to subject them to the relatively minor but still surgical intervention of egg, retri egg retrieval. We could achieve that entire process in vitro. And we could do away with gamete donation, which currently is big business and is still a major issue for men or women who lack uh, the necessary gametes. And in so doing, the projection is that we will probably convert IVF to a laboratory procedure for the most part. I mean, you will still have to prepare the endometrium. You will still have to transfer an embryo to a prepared uterus. But you will not have to do all that precedes it, which is a big piece of today's IVF. 
And in theory, I say in theory, we could improve affordability and access since we all know that IVF tends to be on the expensive side. Not every state has an infertility mandate. Not everybody can afford it. But even as I say that, I realize that we've been there before. We have high hopes that IVG will render the process of conceiving more affordable, but somehow or another, the good old American genius sees to it that we end up with comparable pricing, even though all indications are that it should be a far more affordable procedure. Now, none of this can happen in a vacuum. This is a meaningful intervention with broad implications. And so a technology such as this, by law, comes under FDA jurisdiction. And specifically under the jurisdiction of the Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research, or CBER for short, which is chaired today by a certain Peter Marx, MD, PhD, who chairs or leads and guides this entire process, assembles a committee of experts invariably to assess the application. And not before they sign off can this technology ever be legally and legitimately applied in the United States. Likelihood is that this technology will be categorized under what they call human cells, tissues and products, or HCT slash P's for short. Which brings us whole circle to the Nuffield Council and its priorities and places in vitro gametogenesis somewhere there in our collective vision as we anticipate the future. Those of us who are on the younger side, as I said, will likely see this come to fruition. Uh, the more senior members of the audience may or may not have the privilege of seeing this materialize or and or capitalize on it. But if I were a betting man, I would say this is now just a question of time. And it's good to speak about it now and to get some background so that when this finally becomes a reality, we've all had some sense of what is about to happen. And what is about to happen is really gametes to order. So for now, I will conclude by saying stay tuned because that's really where we are. But we have all taken a glimpse of the future. And while the future is not here, I have a strong sense that it's really just a matter of time before this becomes a reality. Time will tell. And we will all be watching to see where this is evolving, where this is going, and how this is affecting contemporary reproductive technology. So with that, I think it's appropriate to close. And Shelley, uh, I guess I will hand it over to you again to take it from here. Thank you very much, Dr. Adashi. I'm actually going to um, turn over to Dr. McGovern, who's one of our reproductive endocrinologists, um, for some comments and questions. Good to see you, Peter. Nice to see you, Dr. Adashi. Uh, always a pleasure. 
Um, fantastic talk. Um, very exciting. Definitely a brave new world. Um, I feel like uh, from there, it's just a few small steps to, uh, you know, in vitro gestation, and we can simplify the whole OBGYN field and just, you know, everything <laughs> can be ordered and, you know, just show up at the end of nine months with a designer baby. Um, it's it's great. I mean, um, we, we have now definitely rendered the entire male gender completely unnecessary for the reproductive process. <laughs> I appreciate that, although I would... Before you, you make those uh, profound statements, uh, I probably should check with women uh, if they have completely given up on us or not. <laughs> um, I still, I mean, it's clearly, um, I mean, if we are going to accomplish IVG, and in addition, if we are going to accomplish ectogenesis, that's a separate lecture, um, well, uh, it's a different story altogether than for parenthood and especially motherhood. I don't think it's a simple yes or no answer. Although it's very clear that nine months of gestation are difficult, challenging, and life-altering, there are elements of it that when I speak to some of my female colleagues um, are not necessarily dismissed. And so whether or not women would like or would prefer to do away with the process of gestation, for example, uh, is something that I discuss more in the ectogenesis lecture. But it's tied to this phenomenon because all of these new developments or future developments are definitely going to alter reproduction as we knew it. And how we as a society, and women in, in particular, um, deal with this, uh, I think remains to be seen. Uh, I've spoken to many colleagues about this, and I get diverse opinions. Um, in other words, it's not clear cut to me. So time will tell. And uh, as I said, the young members of the audience are going to be there to see and experience it. Uh, those of us who are more on the senior side may miss uh, that opportunity. But um, one way or the other, I do believe the future is bright. It's profitability, clearly. Uh, it opens up new possibilities that didn't exist before. And to some members of society who heretofore were unable to conceive, it opens up possibility of conception. So one way or the other, uh, this will change life as we knew it. How exactly it will be adopted, time will tell. I, I mean, I think it's, for me personally, it's most exciting for the, the, the egg aspects for all the women with premature ovarian insufficiency. And, uh, you know, especially because some of them have really, it's so much more time involved and cumbersome to re to save eggs than to save sperm so it's it's it hasn't been an, op an option for women as easily by any means so we see exactly and then women with turner syndrome and other varieties that uh, uh, we could in the future hopefully help now of course changing chromosomal makeup you would is, is a separate issue and when we talk about uh, male gestation, for example, or male conception, or a uh, same-sex male parenthood, you have to add to all of this a fairly complicated in vitro element. And I say this in this lecture I give on same-sex parenthood which converts an XY cell, let's say in the case of two men, 
into an XX cell, but in vitro. Uh, and that's a step above and beyond what we discussed today and is yet to be really fully materialized and realized. But there is a nature paper out there by Katsuhiko Hayashi from this year who describes just this phenomenon and makes it possible for two male rodents, rodents of course, to give rise to pups. So I don't doubt the feasibility of all of this, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that all the issues were resolved. It's going to happen tomorrow. There are lots of technicalities to overcome. And as I mentioned, significant regulatory barriers to overcome. Not to say anything about societal conservatism, inertia, however you wish to refer to it, because this turns reproduction on its head. After Lord knows how many years that humanity exists, um, and you can go back to Adam and Eve, all of a sudden, the whole notion that we all grew up on of men and women and conception, that is going to be thrown out the window by the time your children and your grandchildren uh, reach the point of reproduction. So there is a sea change underway that is difficult to minimize but it's still somewhat futuristic and it's clearly in the future. But I also think it's unstoppable and inevitable. That would be my guess. I'd like to be there when it happens, but I'm not sure we can count on that. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from the audience for Dr. Dashi? I think this talk gave us all a lot to think about, um, you know, not only from the scientific perspective, but as as you indicated from sort of the bioethics and regulatory side, it got me thinking I should have invited one of our bioethicists to uh, be here this morning for discussion um, as well. Agreed. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I wish I could be there in person, but um, the logistics and the course seem to be standing in the way, so we, we, we're capitalizing on Zoom technology. By the by, uh, those of you who are interested, I wrote a paper in the American Journal of Medicine very recently comparing in-person versus Zoom grand rounds you'll be able to tell my preference for in-person grand rounds, but at the same time, I realize, of course, that times are changing. And um, in in-person grand rounds are likely going to be relegated to history uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and there are advantages to Zoom because here I am speaking to you from Providence, Rhode Island, but you could just as well have a speaker from Los Angeles, California, or from Europe, or from anywhere. And I have spoken to audiences in Egypt, in Europe, and elsewhere, none of which would have been possible absent Zoom. So one has to accept the ups and the downs of it, um, but it clearly is here to stay. Agreed. We have that debate all the time. We miss the human element of being together in a room, but this does allow us to have a broader audience and you know broader range of speakers that we can bring in. Correct. Well, take, a, take a look at that article in the American Journal of Medicine. 
I just realized this morning that in my next lecture, I should probably introduce uh, a, a photograph of the of the front page of that article and say something about it right at the outset. But um, you will have to wait till my next lecture. <laughs> thank uh, well, thank, thank you again for um, joining us today and giving this, us this very you know, enlightening and interesting talk. I, it really gives a lot to think about um, in our field specifically as well. Um, for the audience, um, if you could please stay on the line, we do have our perinatal quality meeting to follow. Um, this one, I'm not sure if um, Elizabeth Blanco is going to start that early or if, um, if since we're 10 minutes ahead or if we will um, reconvene at nine, but I really encourage everybody on this meeting to stay uh, for our perinatal quality meeting. Thank you so much again, Dr. Adashi, for joining us today. My pleasure. Oh, so I'm uh, sorry. Hi, Dr. We have a